Okay, so, uh, well, all I have to do is welcome you all and, and uh, say how happy I am that you managed to make, make it and say that there is a party afterwards which I hope you will, you will join. And I have to hand over to, 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 to Professor Nassim Talib, who is uh, very lucky to have him as a visiting fellow to the Fletcher School based at the Paris Center. And he gave, last year he gave, he gave a talk. And uh, we are trying to develop together several projects. One of them is to, to look at complexity theory and agility and their implications to the things that, let's say to Fletcher things, that, that's uh, loosely defined. And, and uh, so Nassim doesn't need an introduction. I think that if one measures uh, the impact of, of people by how they influence our ideas, then he is certainly one of the most brilliant minds in, the, in this beginning of the new millennium. Um, I thought I'll talk about my overriding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> higher than yours. I yeah, I have a 4.7 <laughs> rating on Uber. He has 4.9. <laughs> <laughs> much better than mine. much how I define myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm going to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about your nearby. <coughs> but before uh, uh, introducing your nearby, I'm going to introduce a topic of complexity. Okay. How many of you? Uh, have an idea of what complexity means. Okay, so the best way, actually, I'm going to try to skip the. Uh, <laughs> no, this is, no, no, because they're, they're, they're going to read the slides. So okay, good. Uh, <laughs> they're more interesting than me, this is why. Uh, uh, that's another uh, trick using complexity. So, how many of you know what complexity means? All right, so we have about what? 30% of people. Okay, typically, you have as many definitions of complexity as number of people you ask. Except if Yanir Baryam is among them, in which case we have three additional. <laughs> so complexity, you know, I, I, it's very hard to define. It's the kind of thing that you recognize it when you see it. And uh, but it is a very rigorous uh, uh, approach to things. So let me before uh, I introduce Yanir, and then I'll, I'll give my my two minutes, uh, my two cents of how does it connect to a Syrian problem. <coughs> Uh, and, and what I'm trying to apply to a specific uh, thing. Uh, Yanir has pretty much you define complexity, you define Yanir as a typical uh, you know, uh, uh, agent in that, in that game in the sense that you come from physics. And, and these people start studying, uh, studying models in physics in which the, the, the behavior of the details matter very little in, the, uh, in defining the whole and scale matters a lot. And Yanir is probably one of the most influential in the field. Would you say you were one of the top three most influential? Okay. He has papers. He just published a paper on agricultural prices. Okay. Uh, he also had papers on uh, microbiology. We have a paper on risk. We have he has papers on on what? There are pretty much papers on a lot of things. Physics, a lot of social dynamics, stuff like that. Things related to application of uh, his toolkit to uh, various phenomena. Extremely well published. I'm very honored uh, to have them, you know, uh, discuss the problem. And uh, and now, and, and, uh, uh, let me try to put some connecting issue about what is complexity or how does it apply to serial complexity. The first thing you learn about the behavior of complex system. You know, conventional science studies interaction. I don't that's study interaction. We study okay. I, I find, if I punch someone on the nose. What happens? You will bleed and stuff like that. You won't have that conventional uh, uh, reduced science. With complexity, you study interaction between components, and, and sometimes and often these interactions swamp the individual behavior. So uh, people, when they study political systems, make mistakes if you ignore complexity. And the first one is scale. Okay, let me remove this so you don't keep uh, taking notes. The first one, that was, uh, uh, these are mostly for me, not for you. So I, in case I have, uh, I have a, a, a amnesia, so I can, I can remember what I'm talking about. The first one is scale. Now, uh, you know how an elephant looks like, no? 
Okay, if there's an animal that's very small that resembles an elephant, what comes to mind? Mouse. Mouse. Mouse and elephant look very similar. The difference between them is scale. Now, a mouse would behave very differently from an elephant. Uh, a mouse is much more uh, robust than an elephant. An elephant, uh, uh, you know, uh, can be extinct very quickly. So you have, so the first thing is scale. So when people compare political system, China to Singapore, they don't realize that effectively communism has succeeded in Singapore. And the difference, they thought people compare political system <coughs> rather than comparing scale. For us, scale comes from the poor political system. That's the first thing that, that will, you know, is counter to how you guys view things. Is that for us, Saudi Arabia and Dubai is probably the same people that have a difference. Okay. So it is a scale matters more than the nature of it. That's the first thing. Okay. And I'll and, and, and near I'll talk about scale. The second point, okay, uh, <laughs> at the scale, if you look at scale, city state has an ecology that's extremely different from that. It's not a small state. The city state is a different animal. The way city states interact. The way they foster commerce, the way they do things, is very different from having a nation state. A nation state is a very modern uh, experiment. Started late, you know, in the, largely in Europe in the 19th century, and I think it will come to an end soon, okay? Especially in, in, in the world. Now, organic systems versus command and control. So let me explain one thing. You, you, you've seen ads before. People have the illusion that, that there's a, a queen, the queen ant. What's the job of the queen ant? To boss them around, tell them what to do? Sorry? No, what's the job of the queen ant? Sorry? That's it. Okay. Reproduction. Right. So there's no, who's the boss in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ant colony? There's no boss. Right. It's a system. It's a system that works by itself. There's no way you can figure out how an ant colony works by looking at individual ants. You're never going to figure it out. Yet it's a complex system. And you have what we call emergence. The level of the system things are different from level of components. Okay. So when we look at uh, 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 the organic versus command and control, you have the illusion. All you have the illusion that the systems are run from the top. Usually, the system run from the top. Self, uh, you know, they fall apart, and that's one other problem with Syria. My my problem with Syria isn't what's going on now. It's that the French came. Aleppo was the wealth, one of the wealthiest cities in the world. Probably if not the wealthiest. I'm, I'm saying through history. I'm talking about that region of the world throughout uh, you know the Asia. And, uh, and by 1800, I think, has highest, had enough standard of living, you know, compared to, say, London, okay? something like that, something crazily high. And it was its own ecosystem, and it worked well. And the French came in and convinced the Syrians that they needed to imitate a top-down centralized system where everything is decided because it's more efficient at a Soviet you know, like, uh, you know, uh, look in a Syria looking building, and that's why Syria was born. So the tragedy of Syria isn't so much in modern time and, and, and in a different religious uh, struggle as much as it is the stupid idea that the French gave them. It's more efficient to have a efficient, uh, more efficient to have a centralized state and series of, of self-governing city, what we had under Ottoman and or Roman uh, days. And then, uh, and, and what works well effectively is having like an ant colony where you can have an incompetent person at the top without it affecting things. So the person with a big ego is very nice, like the President of the United States, you know, affects foreign policy, which matters for you, but day to day, no, it's no big deal. So if you have Donald Trump, don't panic too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you live in the United States, forever. So, and then finally, mixing. At, at, the, the mixing, uh, of things. The, 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 it was. One, of, one, of the, one of the problems of Syria, or one problem that we had in the East, is that some people, people don't understand how communities work. That effectively, to have something stable, you have to have uh, the, the, the Hebrew expression, or each one should be king of his own thing. And that's what Yanir is going to be talking about, is how communities mix, that how people are much better neighbors and roommates, and then how that vast illusion of wanting to integrate everybody 
has backfired and really created a religious differentiation that did not exist before. So this is pretty much what, how we can apply complexity theory. Now, I don't know what Yanir is going to be talking about, and I may disagree with him, but at least the approach is a healthy approach to get rid of the stupid uh, uh, apparatus that we have inherited from, uh, I don't know, 200 years of, of glorification of a nation state and efficiencies and Soviet style uh, thing. Thank you. Hi. What? Pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So um, there's one thing that's really important that I want to say up front, which is that this talk is mostly not about what I'm going to talk about. But it's really the purpose of this talk is to start a conversation which is about how to solve the problems in Syria. And I'm going to spend very little time talking about Syria. What I'm going to try to do is give some key scientific points that will motivate a change of framework that will have to be developed by you. So the challenge here is not, the topic here is not what I'm going to explain as much as the challenge that I hope you will engage in coming up with the actual solution for what's going on in Syria. Okay? So I'm going to spend a little time talking about what I have to bring. And afterwards we'll start the conversation, which I hope will continue not just later today, but for a little bit into the future, about how we can make this really work. So I want to say a few words about complex system science and seem, spend a few minutes on this. Everyone, people recognize this? This is from the Matrix, right? Mm -hmm. So this, if you think about it, is about the world as data. Okay? And these are streaming numbers. And if you wanted to study this using the statistics that you will study here at Fletcher, then what you would normally do is you would take two of these time series and you would correlate them with each other. And if you want to study something else, you will take two other time series and correlate them. So complex system science does something different. We look at the patterns across all the data. And that enables us to ask different kinds of questions and gain different kinds of insights into what's going on. But what I want to do today is talk about a few of the insights that we've gained using this sort of fundamental shift in mathematical approach. And by giving those pieces of information, create this opportunity for changing the framework uh, that I hope very much that you will be the instigators of. So the outline of my presentation is to talk a little bit about what we know from a scientific perspective, and then just say something about the barriers to bringing these ideas into the practical solutions, particularly for Syria, but also for other places. And then that's going to be, lead to the opportunity for a discussion about what we actually need to do in order to make this happen. Is that clear? You with me? All right. So what do we know? So I'm going to talk about two topics. I'm going to talk, talk about global crises. And in particular, I'll spend a fair, fair amount of time on food. And then we'll talk about uh, ethnic violence uh, and geography. OK, so first, global interdependence. We've seen a bunch of global crises recently. These are pictures illustrating pieces of the financial crisis. Um, uh, here is the Arab Spring, which is, of course, a, a, a crisis of global proportion. Um, there is ISIS, which not only involves local activity in a particular place, but people streaming there from elsewhere in the world, either to join it or to oppose it. And it represents a global threat in some sense. And uh, there is just the recent refugee crisis, which I won't uh, uh, talk a lot about except to mention how it's connected bunch of other things. 
what I really what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in one place, which is here in Tahrir Square, and to pull on a thread of inquiry that we have been engaged in about the causes and consequences of these global cascading events. Okay? So the first question is, why did this happen? Well, what's the standard answer that you will probably hear a bunch of times is that there were bad dictators. But these dictators were around for a long time. So that's not a good answer to the question of why it happened in 2010. I can't say now, right? So here's a better answer. These are the black line, which I would point to if I could be on a ladder here, <laughs> is global food prices as measured by the UN index, the FAO food price index, which is food for basic food stuff. So this is what is the price of food for poor individuals that buy grains and not processed foods in the supermarket. The red dashed lines are the dates of food riots and the Arab Spring. <coughs> you see a connection? Now, the connection between food and revolutions is surely not new. French Revolution, Russian Revolution, revolutions of 1848, make a list. But there's something new about this, which is that these are global food prices. <laughs> so one of the key things that happened over the last decades is that the food supply system became a global food supply system. And that's really important in understanding what's going on in the world. There's another thing that's in this picture, which is that there seems to be a threshold, say about 210, of this index, in which things tend to seem to be happening in a whole bunch of places around the world. There's one other thing that I'm going to point out, which is there's a blue dashed line. You see that blue dashed line there? It's not a riot or revolution, it's the date of a report you submitted to the government saying high food prices, social unrest, political instability. That was four days before Mohammed Bazezi started things in Tunisia. So we get some credit for anticipation. This is a slide that illustrates the global food supply system. This is the supply of wheat. So the blue are food producers, the red are food consumers, or wheat consumers. We could do this for corn and for rice and, and understand more about what's going on. But my purpose here is just to impress upon you the nature of how the global interdependence is playing a role in what's happening around the world. Now here is the food price is starting in 1980. You notice something happened? Okay, so this requires an explanation. This is not just the normal behavior. Last period of time from 2004 on is what I showed you before. We've got to understand why that happened. So this question has to be answered by looking at a whole bunch of factors that people talk about in the literature. Among them, claims of a drought in Australia, a uh, meat consumption in, uh, in China, exchange rates that the lower left, and oil prices, where the idea is that high oil prices can lead to the cost of energy to high food prices. And we've actually analyzed all these and showed that these ones are not important. Let me walk you through this real quickly so you get an idea of how this works. So what we have in the lower right is a plot, the dark line is the change in agricultural production of Australia. The gray line is the global change of food production. Well, if the Australian production had a huge impact, well, then surely the rest of the production would have had an even bigger impact, and that is not what we see. So even if you believe that there was a drought, which is not so clear, surely this is not the cause. So we're kind of just going to throw that out. Now notice that we're not doing a correlation. We're asking questions about size and scale. And this is very different from how most analyses of this problem work. 
So here's another one. The blue is the net grain exports from China. And it went down, which means that they consumed more of their own grain and didn't export it. Over the period from 2004 to 2010, it went down by about 5 million metric tons. Well, that's a lot of grain. But the red line is the amount of consumption due to ethanol. It's the US conversion of corn to ethanol, which is indicated there, which is about over 10 times larger. And even if you correct for the feed byproduct, so they ferment corn and they have a byproduct that goes back to grain to feed, you get the red dash line, it's still 10 times larger. So the blue line is just not important. So we're gonna throw that out too. But remember the ethanol one, because we're going to look at that later. Exchange rates. Well, the short story about this is the economist that wrote that this was a factor because of correlations must have been smoking something that's legal only some places in the country because the sign is wrong. Okay, so U.S. is a grain exporter. The prices should have gone in the other direction. So we can throw that out. The oil prices one is something that we'll look at uh, 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 a little bit uh, uh, also quickly. Um, this figure on the lower right shows a bunch of things and I'm going to get back to this. The pale green line shows the mortgage prices or housing prices and the decline of that curve is a mortgage crash. The next line, the dark green, is the stock market which crashed a little bit later and then this peaks over there are all commodities. They're oil, grains, and metals. And one question you might ask is if supply and demand works, why would they all peak at about the same time? Which is an important question. And it's a clue as to what's going on here. But at that time, oil prices and grain prices peaked at the same time, so you might think that oil prices might cause grain prices. But if you look more closely, it turns out that the wheat prices peak three to four months before the oil prices. Well, causation doesn't work that way. So we can throw that one out too, okay? So we've thrown out four, and we're gonna be left with two. One is ethanol, i.e. we take good corn, and we convert it to fuel for our cars. That's the 10% that you see on the gas pumps. That's food being converted to stuff that we burn in our cars. Then there's speculation on commodity markets, which I'm going to add as one of the factors. Speculation is money flows that are not just about supply and demand. When we put all that together, and I'm not going to go into the details here, we end up with a mathematical model that can model the effect of supply and demand, where the only thing that we're going to put in here is ethanol as a shock to the system. And we're going to add speculation, and then we're going to add market switching, which is in a sense speculation when you switch from uh, commodity markets to bond markets or to stock markets. There's very few parameters here. There are two core parameters, and there's a couple of small additional parameters, one of which is not important. So basically, this is like a three parameter model. The blue line is now the data, the red is the model. It works. It works incredibly well. The red is working. What? The red is. The red is the theory. It's the mathematical equation that I showed in the previous slide. Now the fact that it works is very strong validation of throwing out all those things that don't matter and we're only left with two things that we put into the model. There's not very much flexibility in this model. What we learn from this, and you see this dashed line that's increasing smoothly, that's ethanol. So ethanol, increasing in ethanol is a government mandate. The U.S. government passed laws in 2005 and 2007 that dictate how much ethanol is produced in this country, and that curve is a result of that government mandate. The peaks that you see there are due to speculation. When the price goes up, people buy more, driving the price up until it gets so far away that people sell enough <coughs> that they reverse the trend. And once the trend reverses, people sell, 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 and the market crashes. So this is bubble and crash dynamics modeled mathematically, which is 
not done in the economics literature, but we do it because we don't mind modeling dynamics, and we end up with these bubble and crash oscillations. So the peak in 2007-8 is one bubble, and the peak in 2010-11 is, like is like an oscillation that happens a few years later. Now, one of the things that I just want to mention briefly is that when prices are out of equilibrium and speculation causes prices to be out of equilibrium, people know that supply and demand should not match. The price is high, people are not buying because the price is high, so, and people are producing more, and that means that you should have more grain produced than is being consumed. Where is that grain? <coughs> And the answer is, this is a futures market where people buy for six to 12 months later. So if you look six to 12 months later, you see the increase in this green background, that's the inventory. There's enough food in that inventory increase to feed two thirds of a billion people. So this is the food that the people were rioting about because they couldn't get it, because the prices were high, showing up in inventories. This is not food that wasn't available, it's food that was priced out of the reach of people even though it's around. This is a breakdown of the fundamental nature of what economic activity is supposed to be, which is matching supply and demand so that available resources are being used to their best effect. It's a breakdown of market. So this is a really key thing to understand about this, and this is actually a breakdown of supply and demand now we extended this analysis to look at the next 10 months of data here, and the prices change direction. You see that? The blue line changed direction, and so did either the red or green. They're two different fits. It doesn't matter. The green is actually a continuation of exactly the same parameters, and it's as good a fit as the red line, and the theory matches the data after. This is very strong validation out of sample validation of the theory. Okay, I wanted to say one last thing about this picture. What we see here is the crash of the mortgage market, the stock market, and then a huge peaks in the, in the commodity markets. What happened? What happened is that when the mortgage market crashed, people had to put their money somewhere else when the stock market where is the money going to go? There are only four major markets. There's the bond market, the stock market, the mortgage market, and the commodity market. The commodity market and the bond market are the only two markets that are left. The commodity market is much smaller than the others. It's a few hundred billion dollars instead of trillions of dollars, tens of trillions of dollars with the other markets. So when money flowed into the commodity markets, it really shot the prices up. And that's what we saw. Subtext is that this happened because of government deregulation. In 2000, there was the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, which deregulated the commodity markets and enabled money to flow into those markets in an unregulated way, and therefore severely exacerbating this issue. Now, we've studied this a little bit more in various parts of it. And what I've shown here is the banking deregulation, the commodity market deregulation. There were the biofuel mandates for the ethanol, and there's also stock market deregulation that happened in 2007. And after this happened, the mortgage crash, the stock market crash, the food crisis, and riots and revolutions around the world. And then in Syria, where this order was created by the Arab Spring, there's the origins of ISIS and now uh, the refugee crisis. What we're seeing is a cascading effect of interdependencies around the world that are resulting from decisions that are actually policy decisions. And we are not aware of the indirect effects, right, the unintended consequences of these decisions. Is that clear? So are there any questions about this? Let's take a few questions now. Go ahead. So we should in the beginning show the correlation between the food crisis and the revolutions, right? But have you control for like how do you control for other variables? Or Which you, variables you want to control for? Well, 
I would, I would need a couple of hours. <laughs> okay, so the point is the following, that you're thinking about this in a standard statistical way. But what we have is, let's say there's correlation, okay? How do you determine that this is causation as opposed to just correlation? So you know the formula, right? If A is correlated with B, then either A causes B, B causes A, or something else, C, causes A or and B. So now go through your head and try to understand what, at the scale of global influences, could be happening. I have a comment on correlation here, mm -hmm. is that effectively you're dealing with two processes that are extremely what we call fat tail, non-Gaussian, with non-defined higher moment. And you cannot talk about correlation. Everything you know from the statistics is one on one. Is it me or is it uh, Not you. the correlation? Uh, right. So that's the first one. Everything you know from statistics one on one fails. So yeah. your, your eye is much more Better. intelligent right. than statistics. Uh, right, exactly. The point is that the, the linkage is so high that it. You know, the point is that the reason why people work so hard with correlations is they're looking for effects where the coupling is very weak. We're not working with small effects. We're working with such large effects that the relationship between things is transparent. So people, for example, let me, let me take this into the other case. People ask me to do the statistical analysis of the, cup of the relationship between the theory and the data in the food prices. And the statistical test is 10 to the minus 60. It's a p-value of 10 to the minus 60. It's not even a test worth thinking about. Your eyes are so much better at understanding the relationship than the statistical test. It just shows that it's unreal. So no, we did the statistical test. The, the way we test but it doesn't test work. People, if someone uses p-value, it's longer. <laughs> right. I mean, this is part of the issue. Next. Other question. You had a question. Is this the first time we've seen so much influence, uh, influence in the commodity market? At that, no, at that there, scale? in 1973 there was a bubble uh, in the context of the uh, geopolitical environment at the time okay. that was determined to be a speculative bubble. At that time they didn't model it mathematically, they modeled it using the fact that the supply and demand didn't match. And so they said the supply and demand doesn't match, it has to be speculation, but it was much smaller than this. This is a doubling of food prices. Look at this. So this, you have to look at the scale. I should have pointed this out. You see that this axis starts at 100. 100 is the baseline of this index. But if you look at that, the index goes from about 100 to over 200. This is a doubling of food prices. That's a huge effect. This is a doubling of global food prices. This is not a small effect. And that's why it's actually easy for us to analyze it, because it's so big, there can't be very many things that cause it. All right? Yeah. One, more, one more question. Go ahead. Um, how, when you're looking at the uh, causes, like policy on biofuels, how far back do you go when trying to determine future effects? So, you stop at the policy or? So this is a really good question. In this case, the policy is in direct causal uh, relationship with this curve. Right. Um, so I don't have to look very far. Let me add one comment here that's very counterintuitive. Is that uh, you can see the electricity prices, things people can be squeezed on, like you absolutely have to buy something, that a shortage of 1% can cause the price to be multiplied by 5. Well, let's see. So, so this is where if someone is squeezed, and, and the problem is you cannot defer the, the eating. I mean, you, you know, you see all, all of us, many of us like Matt Damon and myself, but you know, we cannot defer eating. <laughs> so, but this is asking a direct the, question, so let me answer the direct. Okay. The, the point is that <laughs> there is no general answer to how far back you have to go. When you're looking at a particular problem, you have to understand it in the context of that problem. And, the point is the following, this is something that's subtle about complex systems, which is that when we learn statistical tools or we learn calculus tools, we assume that certain approximations hold and therefore we can apply the same tools to every problem. When you're dealing with complex systems, the essential responsibility that the researcher has to have is to figure out what approximations can be made in that particular context. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you. Um, what about the period, say, 88 to 90? We didn't study it. So I can't, I mean, this is really, so the point is the answer, same answer. We are trying to add, look at a particular question, and so we're developing tools to answer it in that context. If I extend the time, then I have to make sure again that the approximations that we're using are valid, and I have to look again and see what I know about the problem. Let me go on a bit, because I want to switch topics, and we'll have more questions. But what I want to do next is just take a little bit from this and talk about what we're learning from this. So we've learned that interdependence causes cascading crises. We've learned that there is a dramatic change in global conditions where really nations, every country, is subject to global forces that are outside of their control. And that conversely, national decision making, we talked about the US, but we could point about many other decisions that are being made in different places in the world that have global impact. So we're so connected to each other around the world that everything that anybody does is affecting everybody else in the system. Is that clear? Very important. In order to be able to respond to that, then we have to have actually effective global decision making. And I think it's fair to say from our analysis that the current global decision making is not really good. Right? So that's one piece of this. The other piece of this is that national decision making has to be much better. And in particular, because there is this global volatility, food prices or oil prices or whatever else is going on, um, any governance structure which is not really strong will also fail in the face of decisions that have to be made given the global fluctuations, the global volatility. So we have to address that when we think about what kind of local governance we need. There are going to be shocks. Those shocks are going to knock out anything that is not really robust and constructive. And therefore, we cannot rely on weak governance structures. Okay. Here's the last part of this story. I'm not going to, if you look at the global food prices, you see that it went up, it went up again. This is a current figure. And then it kind of plateaued for a few years, in 2012, 13 in particular. And during that period, the prices were kind of at this threshold of 210. And what we saw during that period is all kinds of riots and revolutions around the world, sort of not everywhere at once, but kind of here and there. It's like, it's like a pot at the boiling point, where you end up with a bubble here and a bubble there, but not sort of consistently bubbling. And then, recently, over the last sort of couple of years, maybe a year, year and some change, the price has gone down. Now, we cannot rely on this into the future, but one thing to notice is that if the price is down, it's now down below 160, maybe there'll be some calming influence on what's going on, and we have a chance to try to repair some of the disruption in order that has happened. But people talk about the new normal, and in particular during that earlier stretch, where we're sitting at the boiling point, everyone talks about the new normal of social unrest around the world, well, if our analysis is correct, this should calm down now, and it's no longer the new normal, but it's not a reversible process, right? This disorder that was created doesn't automatically go back to order, but it may give us a chance, and that's something that we want to take advantage of. Is that clear? Okay. So that's what this says. Now I want to switch to ethnic violence. Yes? You said the shocks will knock out a weak governing structure or government structure that's better in place. What if it is in East Africa and there are in theory no governing structures in place? Is there ever an opportunity to get past that or are you fighting an uphill battle even trying to put those in? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put in one of the key pieces that I think we need in place in answering that question. And the rest of that is going to be motivated by this piece. Okay? Can I just? Yes. Okay. So you, you, you're assuming that when the data changes, it can reverse or influence the reverse of the situation. But if you're in a situation. An opportunity. Yeah, opportunity, yeah. But if you're in a situation where something got broken, 
what by that chalk. Then it's totally non reversible. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying that things are in principle should be calmer. And therefore we may try to build things. Okay. Let me keep going because I want to talk about this and hopefully you'll remember your question. Please write it down. But I would like to get through this. Um, so I want to talk about ethnic violence. I want to build for you an understanding that we have about the circumstances in which ethnic violence takes place. And since ethnic violence is one of the major contributors to social disorder around the world, and is particularly relevant to what's going on in Syria, I need to talk about this for us to discuss the solution. So normally, when people talk about ethnic violence, they talk about lots of different things, social, economic, historical, etc., etc., things that people need to be concerned about. When we studied this problem, we, dis we identified a different approach which is based on geography. It's just based upon ethnic geography and where people of different types are located, are, are settled. And the fundamental statement is that there is a universal dynamics where individuals, if they choose or have a preference to be near others of the same type, they will cause, by virtue of where they move, a progressive creation of islands of progressively larger size of that type. And this process is not dependent upon what the types are. It applies to atoms in a material. And in principle, if the same large scale dynamic properties hold, it will apply to people in society. And in this circumstances, the behavior of the system satisfies property that in physics we call universal. And by universal, what we mean is they don't depend on very much. They only depend upon certain limited things. And if, regardless of anything else, basically what will happen is that the size of the patches will grow in this universal way. What that leaves us with is that at this large scale behaviors of the social system, there's only one thing that I can talk about in any theory that I write down, and that's the size of the patches. So taking this insight from a physics approach, what we're going to do is we're going to say that ethnic violence is related just to the patch size. The question is in what way will it be related to patch size? That's all I can say. And here's the argument. If people are well mixed, so if in, a, in a neighborhood you have multiple types, they're not going to fight each other. If people are separated from each other, so the patches are really large, they're not going to fight each other because they don't see each other. So the only possibility is that there's a certain size in the intermediate size where people will fight each other. Now, you might guess what that size is, or we can fit it to data, but that's the theory. So we have to find patches of a certain size. And if I have a, a population map like this, I can use what's called a wavelet filter to run around and find patches of a particular size that matches the size of the wavelet filter. And I can color them red and look whether the violence is taking place near there. Because right, these are going to be populations that are susceptible to violence. That's the theory. So here's what we're going to do. So by the way, if you have a straight boundary between groups, that's like you have big patches. If you have mix, that's what this is supposed to illustrate, then you don't have violence. It's only patches. Let's take the former Yugoslavia, build the map, apply the filter, Look at, the res look at the places of ethnic violence, put pins on the map, and here we are. Red are the places where we say there are neighborhoods of susceptible to ethnic violence, and yellow are the places of large events. How did we do? Incredibly well. There's a 90% geographical correlation. It's as good as you might hope, because remember that this process is only looking at patches and their vulnerability. It's not cannot tell you exactly where violent events are going to play. So this is as good as you might hope. And by the way, the, 
locations where they say violence takes place are the villages near which violence took place. So, very good agreement. And this gives us a sense or an understanding of why violence is happening. Why? When people are mixed, they don't expect their values to be in public spaces. They accept the public spaces as being not of their own. When people are well separated, their big patches are large, well, they de facto have their values imposed in public spaces. When you have small patches, well, people start thinking that the public spaces are theirs, but others keep walking through and disrupting, and you end up with friction, and then you cause problems. Is that clear? So what is, by the way, just to go back, what is the patch size? It turns out it's about 20 to 60 kilometers. So it's kind of a neighborhood size, which makes sense. It's kind of the natural size for social identification. OK, are we there? Can you say that again? 20 to 60 kilometers, kilometers. is the is, is the, the patch size. That's the okay. size at which violence takes place. Takes place. Takes place. Wow. Okay. Now, with this, so let me keep going for a bit. So below 20 and above 60. Years. No problem. <laughs> OK? So now remember that the below 20 is an integrated society. People are mixed. Above 60 is a separated society. People are homogeneous in their local community. It's only when you have an ambiguous situation where you end up with okay. Now, we did India as well. India works out extremely according to the theory. So there, the upper part is figuring out where the populations are. and then. The lower left is our predictions, the right is the data. And if you look, there's one dot, this red dot in the, in the sort of right part of the main part of India. It looks like we got it wrong, but actually that's Jharkhand. They created a new state because of the extremist violence there. And there's a lot of subtle comparisons that I could talk about in India that really work. But then we did something that you might not guess. Yes, go ahead, ask it. I'm curious if concentration matters. So if, it, if it's important that it be roughly 50, 50, or 30, 30, 30, or the composition of, of the, the local population. Yeah. And the answer is that the analysis uses this wavelet filter. The wavelet filter treats it mathematically. Mm -hmm. So that indeed, if you have 100% in, in the patch versus 100% of the other type around it, then you get a bigger signal than it's mixed in the middle. You understand? So the proportions do matter. And we are using a natural approach to pulling out a single measure of, of the propensity to violence. The theory so far has not been tested to the point where I could tell you that I really know how it works in detail. But it doesn't seem to matter all that much, OK? In, in the sense that if we do sort of ballpark the right thing, then we get the right answer. Does it mean that we could understand it better? Yes, we could understand it better. But you understand my point. So far, we've only used this one mathematical measure, and it seems to work. So why would we do Switzerland? Well, because Switzerland has three major languages. There's also a fourth, right, Romansh, but we didn't do that. And, and two religions that are other parts of the world, they're in great conflict, but they're not in great conflict well, mostly in Switzerland. Okay, and we studied Switzerland because we wanted to figure out how peace works. And the answer is it works by boundaries. There are lots of patches with the wrong size. But fortunately, and not accidentally, there are boundaries. So if you look at the language group, French, German, and Italian, well, there's the Alps, and there's the Jura mountain range, and there's a big lake. And if you look at all of those things, and you extract boundaries, and you look at the lower left, this is what the violence would look like if the boundaries were not there. And on the lower right is the violence including the boundaries. And including the boundaries gets rid of almost all the violence. And we looked at this, and we said, well, there's one place where we would predict violence. 
So we quickly looked up in the news and we found out, you know, there's violence in Switzerland between French-speaking Swiss and German-speaking Swiss, and they have to create a new canton, which is not the right kind of boundary notice, in the Jura range because the Jura range isn't steep enough. Isn't that interesting? So we predicted what happens there. Um, here is the uh, uh, religious differences, and here the relevant boundaries, and this is known because the cantons and the Reformation happened at the same time. The cantons were basically engineered so that religious conflict would not happen. So there are political boundaries. This is a federal governance system where cantons have autonomy, and the upper left is the is the is the uh, religious distribution, and the lower left is what would happen if there were no boundaries, and the lower right is what happens with the boundary. And this includes also the canton of Graubünden that has ethnic violence in it, according to our prediction, except that they have circles, i.e. subdivisions of the canton um, that prevent violence within the canton. It's the largest canton geographically, and it works. And they've done this clearly with full knowledge of this because they split a canton into two half cantons because they were violent. So they understand this. I don't have to invent it. It's if we're doing the science. They knew it. Now I want to look at this for our purposes a little bit more in detail because what we want to do is create peace, remember? <laughs> our objective is about peace. So we better understand this. And if we look more carefully at the cantons, and I don't have all the overlays here, but you can see these are the more... Catholic, these are the more Protestant, sorry, I should you know that, the more Protestant canton. Um, and what you see is that there are areas that are quite green. So we have cantons that are Catholic, cantons that are Protestant, cantons that are mixed. If you look carefully, you see there are cantons where part of it is Catholic and part of it is Protestant, but they're on peninsulas. And so they're not surrounded by the others, so the theory says there should be no violence, as in fact there isn't. So there, and notice also that there are multiple cantons that are Catholic and multiple cantons that are Protestant. So we don't have to just say, well, there's a Protestant country and a Catholic country. We just have a bunch of cantons, some of which are Protestant, some of which are Catholic, some of which are mixed. And there are different ways they can be mixed. Some of them are green, i.e. they're mixed homogeneously, and some of them are mixed, i.e. heterogeneously, but there's no surrounding of one by one. Here is the a more uh, Protestant, more, sorry, more Catholic oriented canton. Notice something else, if you look carefully, it's real hard to see this on this. You see the uh, Freiburg, this uh, blob of yellow sort of in the upper left, middle left. Look, there are several dots sort of to the left of the main blob. Those are part of Freiburg. So the, the, the canton is geographically uh, fragmented into little pieces in some places, which are part of the same canton. And that's another choice that in principle can be made and things can work. So I've said kind of these notes. There are multiple domains of a single ethnic group, not just one, i.e. multiple cantons. There are multiple separate patches of a single political entity, i.e. Freiburg. There are mixed areas separated, mixed areas, separated areas, Peninsulas of one part of the other, and there are different kinds of boundaries, right? The mountain boundaries that work for languages are not necessarily the right as the political boundaries that work for religion. All that clear? Good. So let's go back to Yugoslavia for a moment, because originally when we did Yugoslavia, we didn't put in the boundaries. So when we went back, we did the boundaries. And notice that I've added Slovenia and Macedonia. And it turns out that naturally enough, the reason why we didn't do those in the first case is that if you put in the, without boundaries, that's the left, the B, you get violence there. But if you do the right with the boundary, you don't. That's in the upper part and the lower part. But in the rest of the country, adding the boundaries doesn't help. Why? And the answer is because they're in the wrong place. The boundaries don't align with the population. So it turns out that the parameter values are not changed from Switzerland. 
Okay, so the only difference between Yugoslavia and Switzerland is that the boundaries are in the wrong place. That's a pretty incredible realization. Okay? So the policy implications about this are that neighborhood mixing is peaceful, right? Within a neighborhood, integration works. Second, large domains with smooth boundaries are peaceful. Third, Patches of a certain size are a danger, but all you have to do is to create subnational boundaries appropriately, whatever that means. Our theory doesn't tell you what that looks like. Um, and you're good. You know, I want to take a lot of questions. Let, go ahead, ask one question, and then I'll, then I'll finish this up. Then we'll go. Aren't you concerned that there is a problem by um, cases that happen? A thousand years ago, uh, policy decisions were made uh, and created a system in Switzerland that created a path dependency when the system was closed. Now, Europeans argue Switzerland to be closed today too. Yeah. But uh, using that model for a country today that lives in a system that is not only closed. It's Very good question. And so part of the answer to that is that in fact realizing that the system is not closed, i.e. we have a global system, compels us to think about this more carefully. Right, because, because what we end up is a situation where we don't really have national boundaries either today, in many places. Um, and so the fuzziness of boundaries becomes a key part of figuring out what governance structures are needed at different levels, and I will talk about this in a few moments. Okay. Now, I'm almost done. Well, we're going to have a Q&A after this, yeah. and yeah. then the discussion on Syria. Right. So, uh, so, so, so here's, the, here's the point. <laughs> I wanted the discussion about Syria. So we need where we want to have, where we have problems. So where we don't have separation of the specific path side, they don't have to do anything. Where people have created the patches, and they happen to be in the size, well, it's a good idea to have some federal governance. And then we have to figure out what, where the boundary should be and what kind of autonomy we should create for the groups. So here's the rub. What happens if we don't do this? And the answer is we know what happens, which is that people get separated anyway, only the process is a lot less pleasant. We have conflicts, massacres, refugees, internal displacement that basically take care of the problems that I've been talking about through violence. Is that clear? Um, so the, the conditions dictate that these will happen if we don't act in such a way as to prevent these particular pack sizes from uh, being present without appropriate boundaries. So now I want to use this as a motivation for talking about Syria. And I haven't spoken about Syria, and we're not going to talk about much about Syria until you raise it. Um, but what we've done is introduce some of the basic framework that I think needs to be present. Um, and this is where the opportunity is for really thinking what the global and local governance systems should look like. So this is the ethnic map of Syria. I mean, we didn't put this together. It was put together by uh, 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 someone who's uh, quite knowledgeable about <coughs> Syria and ethnic geography. Um, but it's quite clear by looking at this, even without doing a detailed analysis, that ethnic violence should play a major role in things that go on. And indeed, after the disruption of order happened in Syria, due to the Arab Spring, there's surely many reasons to believe that much of the conflict there is uh, driven by ethnic violence. So we have to recognize that there is a food crisis trigger of disorder. There is an ethnic crisis that is arising from um, uh, ethnic conflict. And somehow, if we want to create peace in this context, we have to address these issues in a way that will work. And remembering that there are going to be future shocks in the global system, the question is how to create a structure which is going to be robust 
and goes back to this issue of that it will be robust and it's a natural solution to the problem. Why don't people do this? Why isn't this being done already? Well, there is a global political consensus that says that we shouldn't do this. Where does that come from? Well, I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but I'll give you my understanding. There is the understanding that the global order is based upon nation states. This despite the fact that the United States is a federal system, as is Switzerland and some other places in the world, that seems to work somewhat, at least. I shouldn't say that the U.S. works. We know that it doesn't, but we'll talk about that some other day. Um, in any case, assuming that nation states are the entity of control, it seems threatening to start creating federal systems that are going to lead to a possibility of deconstruction of that entity through separation, and that looks like a bad path to go down. But, and the other thing is that if you do a federal system, like any kind of separation, you have to figure out what happens with resources, and that becomes a problem that one has to think about. And so it's better maybe not to go that route. But my argument is we've got to move on, okay? I think that the existing structure is not working, and hopefully you guys are bright enough to figure out what's next. What is the next structure of world order that supersedes the Westphalia tradition and recognizes that we have different imperatives today, surely, that were present then, and that what we did then didn't work so well if it isn't working today. <clears throat> So part of this model should be the federal system. And what do we, and, and so the other part of this issue is the local concern, right? So that's the global concern. The local concerns are the people who have power don't want to relinquish it and they're afraid that anything that happens will cause them to lose power. And those that don't have power don't have the authority to make these changes, right? And that's a classic problem, right? But today things are different. The people who have power don't necessarily really have the power. We see that. They're vulnerable. And the people who we think don't have power actually have substantial amounts of power. So maybe it's time to rethink this. So what do we need in order to make this work? And this is my challenge to you. You have one between your classes? <laughs> you know? Well, this is the challenge. <clears throat> Multi-scale governance. We need to create a system where there is decision-making authority at different levels of organization. <coughs> this is transparent that this is needed. The question is, what decisions need to be made at what levels of organization? Yeah, this is the exact opposite of the box. It's a right? We want to Syria and Iraq had the same exactly. The opposite where all the power was concentrated at the top, all right, the top of the country. Right. You're on. I mean, in this country, we have four levels of governance, right? There's town or city, there's district, there's state, and there's federal. We've got to figure out what kinds of decisions making need to be on what place. And notice that I've emphasized the district level because, in principle, that might be the level at which we address the ethnic of variation, the geographic variation of ethnicity by creating domains that are either one or the other or mixed or, you know, all the solutions that were found in Switzerland that might work and we also have to make sure that they're dynamic enough so that if people start moving from point place A to place B that they can accomplish the problem. The other piece of this has to do with the pre-economic problem of ownership. Ownership is the basis of economic systems. We have to figure out how to deal with geographically based resources. This is clearly a sticky issue in places where there are major issue resources in a country are geographically based, like water, land, and oil, and things, as well as historical, cultural, religious places. And part of the issue here is to set up ownership which has both rights and responsibilities. Right? And this is something that is not widely understood, but I'm just sticking it in here because it's really important. 
ownership is often assumed to be about rights, but ownership is just as much about the responsibilities, and that's something that needs to be part of the discussion. So what are the criteria that you have to meet in doing this? Okay, this is your challenge. I'm not doing this, at least not today. I'll help you, but you've got to do the work. Number one, it really has to be natural. It has to fit in a natural way the nature of the system that we're talking about. And therefore, there have to be basically be in some sense only one way to do this. And that's the right way to do it. And I say that lightly. There Zero may be minutes. multiple choices. What? We have negative one minute left. That's fine. I'm done. This is good. <laughs> it has to be natural. The other thing that has to make sense, right, in, in, in ways that really are important to the people who are present there. And you have to deal with the existing reality, which again, I didn't tell you about, but many of you know better than I do, and if not, you better study up for your exams or whatever. Then people have to agree to it, and the reason that they will agree is because of the earlier things. And part of it, of course, is that it can't be coercive. So there are, just this is the last slide, which is, there's a place where we are, we have to map out where we want to go, and in thinking about that, we also have to think about how we're going to get there. So, I've laid out the problem. Happy to hear a discussion. Yes. Uh, yeah, first of all, I think it was fascinating, especially all, everything you said about patches, which is totally original. About uh, what? Uh, what patches, yeah. Uh, but if, <clears throat> if I could take you back to the original point that you made, which is about grain prices and turmoil. Mm -hmm. And so here, if you were to look at a very crude solution and simple solution, as opposed to, again, the massive uh, social engineering that would be required in terms of the, the possible suggestions. So if you go back to something very crude that I could think of is, and here Nassim is going to be happy to hear it, it's uh, what Saudi Arabia did during the Arab Spring. Because Nassim is a great fan of Saudi Arabia. So. Uh, and uh, so what they did was actually, uh, whatever a, a structure that is somewhat rational would do, uh, which was uh, buy social peace in Correct. a massive way Correct. by throwing something so, like, so, I forgot so the number. Let, let me answer your question. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, that's a solution only to part of the problem. Okay? We have ethnic violence all over the world, and Syria is in a mess. So we can't use that solution. It could have been used, maybe, at the beginning of the crisis, and may have stopped the crisis from unfolding. I don't disagree. But we cannot turn back that clock. And the consequence of not turning back that clock, or not being able to turn back that clock, is that if we do solve the other problems as well, then we will create a much better structure that is more stable in the face of other kinds of shocks that are surely likely to happen. So what we know is that it's possible to suppress ethnic violence by having a dictator that nails everyone to the ground. Right? They don't have to move. But in the meantime, there are lots of places where ethnic violence happens, and in the absence of that dictator, the ethnic violence will break out. So a more robust solution is to address both of the issues. I do think that we need to address the food issue. But I think we have to first, in some sense, or maybe because we already have lower food prices right now, we don't have to address the food issue right now. So I'm not saying we don't have to address it. We have to re-regulate the commodity markets. We have to deal with uh, so on ethanol, but this is not the problem. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. We want to talk about Syria. And yeah. Syria. Go ahead. So real quick, you pointed out that food crisis leads to disorder, which in turn leads to an ethnic crisis. I'm curious to hear what you think. Where um, does disorder specifically? How does it translate into ethnic crisis? So, so the answer is that. The reason why there wasn't ethnic violence before then, just like in Yugoslavia, or right? why was it violent before 1990, is because there was such strong central control that prevented anybody from engaging in other kinds of ethnic violence. Once that ethnic control was not present, then the ethnic violence. <laughs> Go ahead. 
just real quick, in serious case, would that give more control to the other way, to the minority, and give them... Again, I'm not talking about the, the, the result of the violence. How it plays out is the process of the violence itself, I'm not analyzing it. What I've analyzed is the fact that at some point there was a trigger that eliminated the order, and then the violence happened, and we have to figure out how to it. Let's, let's go around here, in the back. So if we look at the results of what you proposed in sort of social engineering and um, institutionalizing ethnic um, divides by drawing boundaries, whether they are... Only in the cases where they're in patches of 20 to 60 kilometers. Yes, indeed. But wouldn't that result in <coughs> sort of um, leading places that are mixed and uh, heterogeneous, and in any way sort of intact, and, but moving no, you don't have to move anybody. That's the whole point of the boundaries. Yeah, in other words, if you didn't put in the boundaries, then you would have to move people in order to satisfy the constraints. But by putting the boundaries, remember in Switzerland there are all these funny boundaries? <coughs> the boundaries are there according to where the people are. Yes, but you'll end up in the end with pockets of um, highly interculturally uh, competent mixed and parts of the people that are there. Yeah, so, so that might be, Switzerland does that. That, that might be desirable from a, from a conflict point of view, but if you, you know, how does human progress happen through... Switzerland seems to do a good job. No, I mean, I don't know what you're concerned about, but if you articulate why you're concerned about it, then maybe we could... In other words, what you think maybe is that there is this ideal, idealized melting pot that we should all be part of. But remember that we are not creating the violation of the melting pot. We are responding to the fact that people don't choose to be in the melting pot. And just to say it also in a different way, which is a positive way from a complex systems perspective. If you believe in the importance of individual autonomy, which I'm sure you believe is important given what you've said, then think about it that there is a multi-scale nature of autonomy which allows groups as well as individuals to have autonomy. And when a group decides that they want to live together, it creates a context where we're simply respecting that desire. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what if we do nothing? I mean, like the Swiss seem to have fought for ages. And no, then, <coughs> well, the Swiss only had a fight when the Reformation happened. Yeah, but then, but then it was very short. There was one short war where, yeah. you know, and then they created <coughs> the convention of how the religions were separated by counter. But then they found an equilibrium. Yes. Now, what's happening in Syria now? And I was involved in <coughs> in a project to 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 figure out what are the emerging governance structures was in uh, about two years ago. And now, what's happening is that there are spontaneously emerging government structures. Some of them are, are being <coughs> ethnically sort of homogeneous. Some are mixed, different sizes, right. different, but they're spontaneously emerging. Correct. And they're gradually working. Right. So, 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 so the answer is what I tried to explain so, earlier. So do we, so what I'm, what I'm at, my question is, yeah. Do they eventually find the, the optimum size if we leave them? Right. I mean, basically, this is what I said here. Where there is, where there are patches of a certain size, there will be violence. The violence will either lead to massacres or to uh, refugee populations or to displaced people internally, and that will create the circumstance where the violence doesn't happen anymore. Eventually. Either you do it intentionally, it's like, you know, you either have a war and eventually someone wins or loses and you know, things happen and the violence stops, or you figure out how to have a diplomatic, uh, political, and economic solution, and then you find a solution that works without the violence and the displaced people and the refugees. That's the point. So someone has to do it for the period, sort of, mid, mid 16th, mid 17th century. Well, I, I can't go back. I'm worried about what's happening now. 
Yeah, but I mean, the creation of the risk payment system in that form, for example, Right. Questions over here? Yes. Just incidentally, one, one comment if you want to understand how ignorant uh, the establishment, particularly in the States, is of, of what's going on with the nature of the complex system, uh, look at Henry Kissinger's uh, writing. He thinks that the whole thing started with that modernity and progress started with the threat of, with the Westphalia. Mm -hmm. You think exactly the opposite. Uh, well, it, it may have scientific. contributed to some progress, but clearly it's breaking down now. Yes. So, from the timeline you outlined, it looked like you talked about the deregulation of certain markets as the start of sort of the spiral you've discussed. I was curious if you looked um, prior to that at any sort of trends that would have led to the deregulation. I was kind of thinking like the rise of internet technology or globalization of the market, something like that. Well, I mean, there's been this ideological battle about economic markets and so on. So, uh, the, the, the battle is the uh, understanding that markets need regulation, don't need regulation, but really they only work with regulation. So it was kind of just a moment in the cycle that it finished. Here. Um, I understand you looked at global food prices, the kind of global food prices and conflict, and I was wondering whether um, you considered that climate change and climate induced events might be a kind of factor in making those. So the answer is the hard answer hard. is that not on this time scale. Okay. So people talk about that in the future, they're worried about it 10, 20, 30, 40 years, not on this time scale, not on, on, on 10 years. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Going to the government, the federal government structure you were proposing, usually identities change and how people see themselves change. Yeah. How will you how would you propose that great any setup structure? Great. So in in, in Switzerland, the way things work is that if people start fighting each other, people say, well, let's have a, a, a plebiscite and decide what to do about it. So um, this theory doesn't address identity change. Only in the following sense, that if you tell me what the identity is and I remap the system, then I can figure out how to deal with the identity change. We can develop a better theory that includes identity change, and then we may be able to do it. Or you can make a system that's flexible enough in order to respond to identity change. And what do you do when there are multiple levels of identity, like religious, ethnic? And sure. Well, in Switzerland, they have that? they have uh, French Catholic, French Protestant, uh, uh, German Catholic, German Protestant, all in, in areas where there are patches. It's, you and can so, always find right. Boundaries. So you, you just create boundaries that work. It's not a it's not a major issue. It's just a you know logistic issue. Go ahead. But in Switzerland, uh, I'm from Switzerland, so good. <laughs> we had a, see you did a good job. We had a lot of uh, <laughs> thank you for thinking. Of it. Yeah, thanks. There is there were not only yes you said yes, there were even more more boundaries. There were not only the Protestant Catholicism and the uh, the the language boundaries or the cultural boundaries. There was also periphery center. And there was also a village, the urban and industrial area. Yeah. And all those um, boundaries were not overlapping. And social scientists would argue that's because... Like cross-cutting. The argument that cross-cutting was not worked out because of that. If they had been overlapping, temps might have grown too high. That would right, but, but that's not what our analysis shows, actually. And another point, I'm glad that you actually mentioned the referendums, because <coughs> the referendums were given to the minorities as a concession later, not with the creation of the state, but later when it kind of turned out that only a federal system would not work out, you have to you have to give more. So the institutional design goes hand in hand with the, with the, with drawing the boundaries. Very Just drawing the boundaries, in my opinion, would not be sufficient. Right. So the point is the following: what I've articulated is the nature of the need for boundaries. Now the question becomes: what governance structure do we need to create? I what federal system? And since you guys are studying these things, you know, I figured you would take that part. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, back over there. There are two incongruencies that uh, <coughs> come to my mind that I wonder if you can help me reconcile them. So the first one is you're calling for um, policies, strong, deep uh, policies that would impact uh, social systems. But at the same time, you're attacking the nation state. But who implements those policies are nation states. So you're questioning a system, but you're demanding a system that you're so, so to Perfect. So here is, the, here is the statement. In the context that we're talking about, federal system can be created by a nation state. 
and that it also may be promoted by those from the outside by providing a good model. So you can sit here and come up with a good model and they can choose to adopt it if they like it. Okay, so the nation state, so the nation state can be the agent of change here. Right, eventually, so let me answer your question a little bit more. Eventually, it's clear to me and I hope to you that there's need also for a global governance structure though I, I can tell you some of the properties that it cannot have which is most of what we think about as being governance structures today. But in the meantime, the issue of creating a global governance structure that would have a different role in this context has not been set up, but is not necessary for this to happen. And that's one of the things. Yes, next. Okay, so the mission state is not entirely... Right, it's just a federal system, we know how to do that. Right, right. The second one? The second incongruency, um, if you're asking for uh, a reshaping of boundary uh, so that the size would fall within that major bracket. No, so that when there is a size of population groups of that bracket, that there will be boundaries that will prevent violence according to the analysis. So what happens if the patch that exists do not fit that bracket? We need to reshape. No, no, the other way around. The other way around. There is an ethnic distribution geographical distribution that exists if it doesn't fit that patch size then we don't have to do anything it's only when it has that patch size that we have to do something and create a better and if we have some bad news we have to cut let's let's ask a couple more <laughs> one more question yeah, thank you um fascinating i love the so that's why it's the last question. Um, I'm thinking, what about the situations where the boundary itself is a part of the conflict? The boundary itself is part of the conflict. Give me an example. Cause of the conflict. Cause of the yeah, conflict. contestation of the boundary between the groups. Contestation of the yes, boundary. Yes. Uh, is itself part of what the conflict is about. Okay. And the second thing is, if you, if I understand boundaries not only geographically but in terms of you know, the, the roles of what you get within that social organization, whether it's resources or the stratification. Then again, I I would like to, you know, to think, I think it raises uh, some interesting uh, questions about how would mapping you know, come about? What would mapping do? You know, it's like, because again, it's, it's, if boundaries are also about roles, then mapping is something... What, what, what do you mean about roles? We have groups within society where there is again a movement or attempt to move between the roles that they occupy within that society. Okay, good question. Yeah. All right, let me try to address it. Um, so first of all, we are not linking boundaries to roles. The, the boundaries are here for a particular purpose. The purpose is to give the kind of autonomy, which we need to understand what it is, for people to decide things like what kinds of school systems they should have for the kids in their cultural what that they care about <coughs> or what kinds of public clothing is appropriate or not appropriate when you're talking about roles you are also thinking about economic relationships and other things I'm not linking these two whether they become linked at a secondary level we need to think about but I'm not linking them at this level the, the other point that you made was what happens if the boundaries are themselves <laughs> issues of conflict? Let me just finish this point. <laughs> just at the moment. And the answer is, um, um, first of all, if we find such cases, then most of the time this has to do with this other issue that we talked about, which are the economic ownership issues. And where there are other cases, then, well, you know, hey, we have to figure out what to do. Okay, I have a couple of announcements to make, but before that, I want you to join me in thanking Yanir. Um, there is enough there to speak for months, I think, and what what we try to do today is just give you a flavor of the questions. There are far more questions than answers, and there are far more research that needs to be done. It's mind-blowing in, in that sense. So 
what I would like to say before we go down to the party is that those of you who are interested in pursuing this, uh, join the, the, the Friday Center e-list because I will be sending further reading material and opportunities to have to, to follow up, so either in furthering our understanding or doing more research or trying to come up with initiatives that would, that would help uh, if possible in, in situations like Syria or, or, or others. So this in a way is the beginning of something we do not know where it will lead as complex systems. So thanks again and and there's wine. And come down to the <laughs> come and join us at the Fire Center right here. Thank you.